Hello everyone, I'm Mirko Ravanelli, and in this brief talk I will introduce my last work on SyncNet. Uh, what is that? SyncNet is a neural architecture for efficiently processing raw audio data. So it uh, can be used for speech recognition, for speaker recognition, or for all the tasks that require processing of uh, direct processing of the raw audio waveform. Okay, but why do we need special architectures to process audio? Well, let me first of all say that deep learning is mostly about finding good representation of your input signals. And when your input signal is an audio sequence, we actually have a problem, because audio is a very high dimensional sequence. Why? Because, for instance, in one second we can have 16,000 features if the sampling frequency is 16 kHz. So, and we, or we know that working in a, in a very high dimensional space can be very, very, very challenging for any machine learning system. So for this reason, in the speech and audio community, uh, what we do we is, is um, we typically use uh, pre-computed handcrafted features like MFCC, PLP, uh, banks, all these kind of representation that help to achieve a more compact representation of your input signal. But these handcrafted representations are mainly designed from a perceptual evidence, and there are no guarantees that these features are optimal for all the speech and audio tasks we would like to address. Let me give you an example. So let's consider this vowel a third in this sentence. And if you take a look into the spectrum of this vowel, you may see that it's characterized by several peaks, which are the pitch basically and the formats. But if we process this spectrum with the typical filters used in, uh, in for amplitude extraction or filter bank extractions, we basically raise to smooth a lot of spectrum, possibly hindering the extraction of very important information embedded in the speech signal, like the pitch and the formats. To mitigate this issue, uh, several recent works have proposed to directly feed a neural architecture, typically a convolutional neural network, with raw audio samples. Um, in a standard convolutional neural network, the first layer performs a convolution between the input signal and a set of filters that are learned from data. So what's the problem with that? According to me, the most critical part of the architecture is the first convolutional layer. Why? First of all, uh, because the first convolution layer has to deal with high dimensional data. As we have seen before, high, and dealing with such a high dimensional data can be very critical for a neural network. And the second big problem is that the first convolution layer is the most is, is very sensitive to vanishing gradient problem, especially when we employ very, very deep architectures. For this reason, if you train a convolution neural network on audio samples and you analyze the filters learned in the first convolution layer, you may see um, some, some kind of weird shapes. For instance, in this figure, we, um, we show some of the filters that we have learned for a speaker ready task, but you uh, may uh, see something similar for a speech recognition task. Basically, the first line, the first row shows the, the filters in the time domain, while the second one shows the filters in the frequency domain. Well, you can see that the, the filter in, in the middle actually ha, has a kind of a well-defined shape, which picks up a certain frequency, frequency in a spectrum. But the other two have, have a kind of very, very, very weird shape. The first one is very very noisy while the second one has this kind of strange 
multi-peak, multi-band multi shape. And, well, this kind of filter shapes could make some sense for the machine, but are very difficult to interpret uh, from by humans, actually. And also, in my opinion, it's not only a problem of interpretability, this kind of shapes, uh, in my opinion, is also an indication that uh, we basically do not end up with a very efficient representation of our input signal. Well, when I saw these crazy shapes of the filters, I asked myself, how can we improve it? How can we help the CNN discover more meaningful filters? Well, one idea is to inject a kind of prior knowledge into the problem, especially into the filter shape. So instead of leaving the system learn filters of any possible shape, we just force the filter to take a predefined shape that we uh, believe is uh, uh, more meaningful. Okay, but how can we do it? Uh, in standard CNN, we basically perform a convolution between an input signal and a set of filters and we learn all the basic elements, all the basic types of each filter. In SyncNet, we propose to do something different because we perform a convolution between the input signal and a predefined kernel that depends only on a few parameters. So this predefined kernel basically injects our prior knowledge into the problem. So the question now is, what could be a good choice for G, for our predefined kernels? Well, there are many possible choices for our kernel G. Um, I think one reasonable choice is to set G such that we implement a set of rectangular bandpass filters where instead of learning all the basic elements of the filters, all the basic types of the filters, we learn only the low and the high cutoff frequencies. So basically, uh, for each filter, we just learn two parameters only. Um, well, a rectangular filter bank um, can be seen, can be written as the difference between two low-pass filters where F2 is greater than F1. So now if we take the inverse uh, Fourier transform of that and we go back to the time domain, we have these uh, expressions, which is the difference of two sync functions. One characterized by, by the parameter F2 and the other one characterized by the parameter F1. So our kernel, we, we basically perform the convolution of the input signal with several kernels done in this way, where for each filter we just learn the cutoff frequencies. So if you take a look into the filters learned by SyncNet in, uh, in the same speaker ID task we have outlined before, you can see that now the shape of the filter is very well defined and we implement basically a rectangular filter bank in a, for all the filters. Okay, but what are the properties of this model? Um, one interesting property is that we have only few parameters to learn. If f is the number of filters, let's say 80, and m, l is the length of each filter, let me say 100. In a standard CNN, we have f times l parameters, which are 8k. While for SyncNet, we just have two f parameters, which is 160. So we have basically, in this way, a very, very, very compact representation of our, um, of our input signal. Another interesting property is that the number of parameters does not depend on the length of the filter. This is interesting because we can, this way, we can achieve high frequency selectivity without wasting parameters. 
So for instance, we may, we, for extracting pitch or formal, we, we may want very, very selective filters and we can do it without wasting uh, parameters. And that's a, a very interesting property of the model. Moreover, we can implement syncing in a very efficient way. Why? Because the proposed kernel G is symmetric, so we can basically perform the convolution only considering one side of the filter and inheriting the result for the other half. And this saves 50% of the computations. SyncNet also converges faster than a standard CNN. In this figure, we show the, um, the frame error rate obtained on a speaker identification task train on Timit. And here we show basically the, um, the performance on uh, the held down data. And we can see that the SyncNet model converges faster and to a better performance than a standard CNN. Moreover, uh, we argue that the filters learned by SyncNet are a bit more interpretable than the filters learned by a CNN. For instance, in this figure, we show the cumulative frequency response of CNN and signet filters learned in a speaker ID task, basically a speaker ID task trained on the LibreSpeed dataset. Uh, the cumulative frequency response is just obtained by summing up all the filters, and it is a useful tool to figure out which area of the spectrum are more or less covered by filters. Um, if you take a look into the blue curve, which is the one of the uh, CNN, you can see that the, the, the model tends to focus a little bit more on the lower part of the spectrum, which is totally makes sense because of the characteristic of the speech signal. The same happens for the um, SYNCAD model. But with SyncNet, we are even able to see something more, because we clearly see three peaks in the cumulative frequency response. One corresponds to the pitch, while the other two, which do not appear in the standard CNN, likely correspond to first and second formats. So basically, with SyncNet, we can see something which is a bit more explainable to us for the task we address. Okay, in this experiment, we instead show some of the speech recognition experiments that we have done. Uh, for instance, here we took the TIMI dataset and we have artificially corrupted it with a lot of noise in the bandwidth between 2000 and 2500 Hz. So the noise is really a lot and makes this bandwidth clearly unusable and could be very interesting to know if our CNN or SyncNet models are able to figure out that they have to avoid such a very noisy bandwidth. The second row of figures here shows the cumulative frequency response uh, at the end of training. Here, what we can see is that at the end of training, both models are able to understand that they have to avoid such a very uh, noisy bandwidth. But what is interesting is that SyncNet is able to learn it much faster. For instance, the first row of figures shows the, um, the cumulative frequency response obtained after processing only one hour of speech. So here we basically are, are at epoch zero and we only have processed the first hour of speech. Uh, you can see here that the CNN doesn't uh, has still to figure out that uh, it has to avoid the bandwidth. It's only focusing on sure on, on, on the lower part of the spectrum. While SyncNet is already able, even after seeing very, very, very few trained data, is already able to figure out that it has to avoid such a noisy bandwidth. Okay, let me now show you some more quantitative results starting from speaker recognition. 
Um, in particular for the study, we have considered a rather challenging speaker recognition scenario because we have trained a system only using from 12 to 15 seconds for each speaker, and we have considered very short test sentences ranging from 2 to 6 seconds. So, um, here on the left, you may find our speaker recognition results, speaker identification results on both Timit and LibreSpeech. In Timit, we have considered 462 speakers, while for Timit, we are considering more than 2,400 speakers. Okay, so what emerged here is that uh, the best model is Syncnet, which is able to outperform uh, a CNN based on all features. And interestingly, it is, almost, it is also able to outperform uh, a more traditional systems based on CNN fed by filter banks and a DNN fed by MFCC. So here, Syncnet is also able to outperform systems based on more traditional handcrafted features. On the right side here, you can see the speaker verification performance, which is obtained using the D vector technique. Um, the outcome of this result is very similar to the speaker identification task because Syncnet provides the best performance and is able to outperform other models. Another an uh, interesting aspect is that uh, we are even able to outperform uh, an high vector baseline. Of course, the uh, detailed comparison between high vector and DNA model is not the scope of the paper, this paper, but we are able to basically achieve a better performance with uh, Syncret. Uh, this is not very surprising because um, here we are in a challenging scenario characterized by little training material and short short training and short test sentences and a neural network is likely to uh, generalize a little bit better than an uh, i vector system okay let me conclude this presentation showing some results on speech recognition um, here in the table we show some experimental evidence on the timid and on the data data set the letter corpus is recorded in a domestic environment and it is characterized by the presence of a lot of noise and reverberation, uh, making it a very, very challenging speech recognition task. Uh, from the table, you can see that Syncnet outperforms CNN models, both trained on row features and uh, trained on FBank features. Um, so basically, for a table emerged that Syncnet works quite well for ESR as well, and uh, also interesting, uh, Syncnet uh, is also suitable uh, to work in noisy and reverberant conditions. That it's not a trivial outcome, especially because we learn something directly from the raw features. Okay, conclusion. In this brief talk, we have seen promising results of Syncnet on speaker and speech recognition tasks, we have seen that SyncNet gives us more interpretable filters that are more tuned on the specific task addressed by the neural network. However, a SyncNet defines a new way to process uh, audio sequences that can be used in many other fields, such as keyword spotting, emotion recognition, speech separation, music processing, and many others, and in the future we would like to expand the experimental evidence of Syncret. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Feel free to take a look into our GitHub repository and for more details, take a look into uh, our paper, which is now available, available on Archive. Thank you very much.